Our task is now to uh, determine what is a Lagrangian for a vector field. Once we have this Lagrangian, we will be able uh, to determine the classical limit and also we will be able to solve it in quantum field theory for a free field and from that we will be able to uh, look at interaction between sources. So exactly the same thing as what we did for the scalar field, we are now just upgrading our theory to the case of a vector field. First we need to determine what is this Lagrangian. Um, there are different ways to determine a Lagrangian uh, in a quantum field theory. Uh, we saw one uh, possible way when we were looking at uh, scalar fields. We will now look at a different way. Um, we will assume that we know what is a, a classical equation of motion that is a classical limit of the theory and from that we will build up our Lagrangian. So we will first see how it works in the case of a scalar field as a warm-up and then we will apply that to vector fields. So assume we know what is the equation of motion for a free scalar field. and We know that uh, it's the Klein-Gordon equation. We know that to get this equation, we uh, have to take the action to be stationary, so that's a stationary action principle, which gives us the classical limit of a theory. So a possible action, which will give uh, such uh, an equation of motion, the Klein-Gordon equation of motion, can be uh, written by um, multiplying uh, by the scalar field phi on the left, and then integrating over space-time. Alpha is just a constant which I need to determine and I can easily uh, check that by plugging this expression for the action into the stationary action principle I will recover the Klein-Gordon equation of motion. I know the action is a space-time integral of the Lagrangian density but this expression cannot be uh, what I'm looking for for the Lagrangian because um, it's a function of the field and the second derivative of the field. And what I want is a Lagrangian which is only a function of the field and the first derivative of the field. So the technique is then to integrate by part uh, one of the covariant derivatives and keep in mind that we always uh, consider that our field is zero at the infinite boundaries of space-time. We now fix the sign of alpha by requiring that uh, the kinetic energy must be positive. Uh, that is, the sign in front of uh, delta phi squared should be positive. And because we already have a minus sign, that means that alpha has to be negative. And by convention, we fix it to be minus one half. And as the action is the space-time integral of the Lagrangian, we therefore recognize the Klein-Gordon Lagrangian for a free uh, real scalar field. We now want to use the same technique to determine the Lagrangian for a massive vector field. So which uh, classical equation of motion should we start with? In the case of the massive scalar field, we had the Klein-Gordon equation. And it makes sense to consider that each component of the vector field uh, also obeys the cl similar Klein-Gordon equation. And that if you think about it, that's uh, not such a crazy idea because if we step back a little bit and come back to relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, we get the, the Klein-Gordon equation um, simply by requiring that the particles obey uh, e squared equal p squared plus m squared. And that's a property which doesn't depend on the spin. Therefore, we expect to have the same relationship between energy and momentum for a vector field as well. And therefore, it makes sense that we should uh, impose each component of the uh, massive vector field to obey the Klein-Gordon equation. So what I have written here is actually four equations because we have four components for the Lorentz vector a mu. So we have four degrees of freedom. Uh, the problem is that we only want three degrees of freedom because the spin one uh, massive object has only three uh, possible degrees of freedom. Therefore we need an additional equation to constrain uh, and then reduce the number 
of degrees of freedom by one. We only need one equation because we need to get rid of one degree of freedom. So this should be an equation on mu, but because we only want one equation, we need to contract the Lorentz index. So we need to have something with an upper index mu here. We could use also mu, but the problem is that it will give me an equation which is quadratic in mu. And remember, we want to start with an equation which is linear on the field and then multiply on the left in order to get uh, an equation which is quadratic in the field. And then by integrating over space-time, we get the action. Um, so we don't want something which is quadratic in the field, so I should choose something else than mu. So instead we will use a covariant derivative del mu, and we want to constrain del mu mu. The simplest constraint we can use is to uh, impose this to be equal to zero. So what we just did here is to fix the gauge. Uh, that's something we may have heard already in the framework of electrodynamics. In doing so, we reduce the number of freedom by one, and we then therefore end up with only three degree of freedom, which is what I need for a massive spin one field. So these are our classical equation of motion for the uh, classical vector field. Uh, however, uh, for convenience, I will uh, combine these two expressions into only one, uh, which is what I will use then to build the Lagrangian for the massive vector field. So I gave you here the expression for uh, an equation which is equivalent to these first two equations here. Uh, what I'm going to do now is to show that indeed uh, this equation, number three, uh, is equivalent to equation one and two. So for that, I will first ap apply del mu on the equation three. I used the metric in the first term to raise the index of del mu, giving me del mu del mu squared, uh, minus del mu del mu, which is just del squared, uh, del mu. And of course, the covariant derivatives can be swapped, and we see that uh, what is between the parentheses is just zero. So we end up with m squared del mu m mu is equal to zero. If we assume that the mass is not zero, then I recover the second equation uh, of my uh, classical equation of motions. Now that I have shown equation 2, I can use it in equation 3 in order to cancel the term in del nu a nu. The metric is a constant, therefore it commutes with del squared, and I can use it to raise the index of a nu. And then I recover equation 1. So I have just shown that equation 1 and 2 can be combined into equation 3. So equation 3 is from no one or a classical equation of motion for massive vector fields. We are now ready to uh, use this equ classical equation of motion for vector field in order to get our Lagrangian, and for that we will use the same technique as what we did before for the scalar field. Uh, so we see that what we have to do is to take the left-hand side of the equation of motion, multiply by the field, and integrate over space-time in order to get uh, the action. Then the action um, is rearranged using integration by part, uh, before we can finally recognize an expression for our Lagrangian, which is a uh, function of only the field and its first-order derivatives. We now insert the field in the bracket, and using the metric, we will raise its index. Where I have replaced uh, del squared by del mu del mu. We'll now use an integration by part to make the first del mu act on the left. So the minus sign comes from the integration by part, and remember that's all we have, because we consider the field to be zero at the uh, uh, boundaries of space-time. For the second term, I need to do some massaging before I do the integration by part. So the first thing uh, I will do is to raise the first uh, mu index and then therefore lower uh, the second one. I will also um, uh, swap the two derivatives because uh, they commute. And finally, because mu and nu are dummy indices, I will uh, swap them. So again, I did an integration by part, and therefore I had to change the sign uh, when in doing so. 
We now want to fix the sine of alpha using uh, the constraint that we want a positive kinetic energy. So what I need to do is to isolate the terms uh, in this expression which have uh, squares of time derivative of the field. So for the first term, I see that's obtained uh, by isolating the term for which mu is equal to zero. For the second term, I get the square of time derivatives uh, by taking both mu and nu equal to zero. Indeed, A0 is the same whether we have an upper index or a lower index, and therefore we have the square of uh, delta A0. So that's my kinetic energy, uh, which is proportional to alpha, and I can rearrange by uh, expanding the product of A nu, A nu, uh, in terms of time component and space-like component. Remember that because of the metric, I have to change the sign in front of the space-like component. We see that the time-like component cancel, and therefore we are left with alpha times a positive quantity, because it's a, a square, and therefore in order to have a positive kinetic energy, I need to have alpha being positive as well. As in the scalar case, the sign is fixed by the physics, by the requirement that I want a positive kinetic energy. However, the magnitude, one half, is just a convenient choice. Notice that the sign we obtain here is the opposite as what we had in the scalar case. So the term in the bracket is a possible expression for our Lagrangian. We indeed see that it's a function of the field and its first-order derivatives. Um, but we will uh, now introduce uh, the electromagnetic tensor in order to uh, express this Lagrangian in a more familiar way. We now square f mu nu. Let's start with the product of the first two terms. Then we take the product of the first and the last terms. If I now take the second and third terms, and noticing that nu and mu are dummy variables, uh, therefore the product of these two terms uh, will again give me the same uh, del mu a nu, del nu a mu I got before. And similarly, when I take uh, the product of uh, the second with the fourth term, I will again recover uh, del mu a nu uh, times del mu a nu. We then get an expression which is proportional to the first two terms of our Lagrangian, which can then be re-expressed as... Remember that at some point I had to consider my mass being not equal to zero. However, now if I take the mass equal to zero, or if you prefer an infinitely small mass, I recognize the Maxwell Lagrangian of electromagnetism.